to the session on hybrid electricity markets to finance long-term investment at the 2021 virtual IAEE conference on energy, COVID and climate change. I apologize for the delay to get uh, this uh, session started, which was uh, due to uh, technical issues and uh, we're now all set and ready to go. Uh, we have a panel of very good uh, speakers uh, today with us to discuss this uh, crucial issue of uh, hybrid market designs. We have uh, David Newbery from the University of Cambridge, Fulvio Fontini from the University of Padova. We have uh, Michael Grubb from the University College London, and we have uh, Fabien Rock from University Paris Dauphine and Compass Lexicon. My name is Jan Horst Kepler. I'm also from the University Paris Dauphine and also the scientific director of the Share European Electricity Markets, where we have, and this is of course not a pure coincidence, a large research project going on uh, hybrid markets. Hybrid markets for the time being will have a very large definition of them, but the different speakers will, of course, uh, uh, bring different perspectives to them and uh, we'll all have a better idea of uh, what they could be after the session. Is for us any system that allocates funds in electricity market that will articulate a competitive dispatch at short run marginal cost, as we know from uh, the deregulated markets, uh, with additional forms of remuneration that will ensure the full financing of long-term capacity in a transparent and predictable manner. And I think that's very important, these two words, predictable and transparent, in order to make markets, electricity markets, in particular European electricity markets, work as they should. With that, I would like to hand over directly to David Newbery, who will be the first presenter in this session. David, over to you. Well, good morning or good afternoon and good evening. And um, I want to talk about the implications of <clears throat> reaching net zero in terms of how fast and why we need a market design suitable for that. And to do that, we need to first clarify what principles are needed for setting efficient short run prices. And then from these short run prices, think carefully about the need to give long-term signals through various forms of capacity auction support, support for first of all, flexible plants needed to deal with the variable plant. Uh, secondly, to de-risk the, the controllable, low carbon, zero carbon options, particularly nuclear power. And finally, to think much more carefully about what kind of long-term contracts we need for variable renewables. And all of these, in addition, place additional problems in terms of security of supply. And if I have time, I'll touch on those. But first, this is for the UK, and this shows the nature and the speed with which we have to address the problem. Already, we are reaching over 30% variable renewable electricity, <clears throat> that can be managed quite easily given the large amount of flexible fossil fuel you can see on the system. But by 2030, relatively soon, we will be up to 64% on one projection. And as you can see, the amount of fossil fuel available to deal with that variability has decreased dramatically. So to the principles we need. And <clears throat> again, as an economist, I would say that the obvious way to correct market failures is as close to the source of those failures as possible. I think we're all familiar with the climate change, the carbon dioxide externality, perhaps less familiar with the learning externality that goes with the quite dramatically fast learning in renewables. But I want to stress the lack of futures markets, which is the reason that we need substitutes to give better signals, and those, in fact, are contracts. 
I want to point out that electricity is not a single homogeneous commodity and therefore the prices have to reflect all of the different aspects of those services supplied. When it comes to investment, the striking feature about all low carbon investment is it's very capital intensive with very low running costs. And that means the cost of finance is the main cost and reducing that cost by reducing risk is the fastest way of lowering the cost of meeting the challenge. <clears throat> and these long-term contracts need to take that into account, but also to deal with various other market failures. And to think about security of supply, we have to take now a much more systems approach. We're moving from a completely different set of kinds of power plant uh, to ones which are highly correlated with each other. So when I talk about the characteristics of energy, um, I want to distinguish between the energy itself, the megawatt hours, and we need to provide signals that reflect its efficient cost, but also its value. Um, the system marginal cost is the cost of the most, most expensive plant on the system, but when no more can be called upon, we then have to ask what are people willing to pay uh, to continue receiving or how much do they need to be compensated to reduce demand. And the best way of doing that is put both demand and supply onto a single auction platform. <clears throat> but energy itself, its value and its cost varies over time and space. <clears throat> to deal with the time aspect we need good hedging instruments. <clears throat> but we also need <clears throat> good spatial signals, good locational signals, particularly for locating new investment. The value of capacity is the value of meeting demand. And that will be the value of lost load, and it will vary with the loss of load probability. So the full price has two parts. It has the system marginal cost and the probability of supplying is one minus the loss of load probability. And if you lose load, then it's the value of lost load. And those reflect both the supply and the demand side. But the investment signals have to address the problem that we lack sufficiently far future um, futures markets. <clears throat> and uh, the particular way I would suggest that we deal with that is through an auction in reliability auction options where the reliability, reliability option auction sets a strike price and that has to be sufficiently high that all available controllable plant is willing to operate. Now in many markets that's set in dollar terms um, in the Republic and Northern Ireland, it's $700 a megawatt hour roughly. But we have seen in Texas that the price of gas can rise well above that. So we have to have a mechanism to release the um, price to make sure that the plant will actually generate. <clears throat> and then the auction finds a price P at which people are happy to accept the strike price um, and then the market price is allowed to reflect the full scarcity, but the system operator has to make sure that the spot price does in fact reflect that scarcity through setting a floor price. And then the generators can decide whether they want to be exposed to this variable price or to have a hedge which pays them a fixed amount but limits the price they can earn and the advantage is that the consumers will pay no more than the full price. <clears throat> and this way, both sides of the market, if the, the producers, if they wish to, can hedge against the variability of the price. Now, to come on to the, um, the zero carbon investment that is controllable, and particularly nuclear power, and I mentioned how capital intensive it was, the graph on the left shows how the price of generating electricity, the levelized cost varies with the weight of average cost of capital. And you can see that if you go from more of a regulated price of 3.5% real to a more commercial price, 
in a liberalized market of 8%, probably on the low side, the price basically doubles. The right-hand graph points out that the cost, the real cost of borrowing has been decreasing steadily for the last 20, 30 years. It shows no sign that that trend is changing. At some point, clearly it will, but effectively we're almost down to zero real interest rates. Uh, so um, a, a regulated weighted average cost of capital now makes these very durable assets cheap. And the way we can do that is to follow a model that has been tried and tested for network investments in the grid and distribution networks and gas pipelines, a regulatory asset-based model uh, then guarantees a return on that asset base. It's periodically reset as the cost of borrowing changes and the holders of that receive a return on and depreciation of the wrap. We know how that works and it delivers cheap long-term investments. When it comes to variable renewables, um, at the moment there's a serious problem because they, even if they have a contract, typically pay on their metered output. And that um, typically distorts their output and location decisions. Uh, in particular, it amplifies the value of being in a windy or sunny location, typically far from demand centers. And it distorts the merit order when the prices are low and flexible plants should be called on. Uh, in some jurisdictions, the variable plant is not allowed to bid below zero but that is not universally the case. So we need a different form of long-term hedge for these variable renewables. <clears throat> and when we think about the market failures, um, the, just, the learning spillovers that do justify support, and that is the main argument for the renewables directives in the European Union, but it's important to identify where that learning takes place. It is in designing, then manufacturing and installing the equipment, the wind farms or the solar. And it's the capacity, therefore, the installation, not the output, <coughs> that we should support, providing, of course, that the output then actually operates. So we need an efficient market price to guide the efficient location and the efficient output decisions. <coughs> to coming back to the problem with the present contracts, they typically pay a fixed price, um, usually well above the market price on the metered output. Whereas a standard contract for a flexible plant gives a contract which is independent of the output. And that means the short run operating decisions are taken purely on the basis of the variable cost of the plant. So how do we design a contract for difference, a long-term contract, for a variable plant, which has that characteristic. And the solution I would propose is that we base the contracted amount um, on the forecast output at the day ahead stage for the regional amount of the resource. And that way, the decision to operate the particular wind farm or solar PV will be independent of this actual output because it will be predetermined by this forecast output. So that deals with the short run operating decisions and it also produces a sensible location decision providing we limit the number of full operating hours so that we don't over reward high resource areas. <clears throat> and that could be done for instance for a wind farm to say the first 30,000 megawatt hours per megawatt of capacity will be paid under this contract. Thereafter, you get the market price. And clearly, we know that auctions are the best way of determining new contracts. The old contracts have already made their location decision. So the obvious thing to do is to grandfather them to avoid them complaining. Finally, coming to security of supply, the old world was one in which we had a large number of independent power plants which occasionally failed or transmission lines or interconnectors which would occasionally experience outages and the system operator would make sure that he could withstand the loss of the single largest critical element on the assumption that these losses were statistically independent. <clears throat> 
But when we come to variable renewables, they are strongly correlated. They almost act like a single plant. And the capacity auction has to worry about the risk of widespread lack of supply, not of an individual plant outage. On top of that, we have seen in Texas and in California, and we will no doubt see elsewhere, that climate change is increasing the risk of extreme events that prejudice the security of supply of the whole system. Finally, uh, and again, we are learning as we go along that with all the smart controls, with very fast response batteries, with DB and wind, which can be adjusted electronically, these electronic controls interact in as yet not fully explored ways, and we will be learning as we go along. So the system operator collectively has to deal with a whole set of new problems that are quite different from the old ones. So to conclude, <clears throat> we have a world in which we have high capital cost plant with low variable costs, and that makes it more important to distinguish the, the elements of the energy supply, the capacity it can provide, which may be controllable or variable, the energy when it's delivered, where it's delivered, and the quality, which means all these ancillary services that I haven't touched on. <clears throat> the market failure I have concentrated on are missing futures markets, and the standard hedges to deal with risk, like the classic contracts for difference, work because they, dis, uh, they um, disconnect the output from the risk sharing, and we have to follow that model when it comes to variable renewables. <clears throat> um, we have to think carefully about why we support renewables. We have to make sure that the market prices reflect the efficient carbon dioxide price, but we specifically need to put the renewables in a better place and make sure that they are dispatched in an efficient way. And in order to do that, we need a hedge to reduce risk to be based not on metered output, but a yardstick pricing format. And we need to limit the support we provide to high resource areas. And with that, I will pass back to our speaker and I look forward to hearing the discussion. Thank you very much indeed, uh, David. Uh, very, very thoughtful. Uh, um, uh, presentation on, on, on three, uh, three very, very important uh, issues. I have uh, follow up questions to understand better uh, uh, to, 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 to all three of them. But uh, of course, uh, I will, I will uh, hold back and uh, um, wait for the discussion. And uh, we will move right on to the presentation by Fulvio Fontini. Uh, which I think uh, will speak uh, also to the issue of reliability options. So uh, we'll see how, how these uh, two presentations communicate. Fulvio, over to you. Thank you, Ian. Let me share the screen and we will start. Um, okay. You can see it well. Okay, excellent. Just a second. Okay, so thanks. And it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to share the virtual floor with such a distinguished panelist. Um, I, will, I will draw a bit on what already has been introduced by David. Um, just talking about reliability options and also uh, the learning externalities, uh, perhaps from a different point of view. Um, now, now, normally, uh, whenever you think about uh, CRM, a capacity remuneration mechanism of any kind, typically the studies focus on the relationship between benefit and cost, so whether they are needed, uh, and whether they are effective in delivering security supply or not. As David was correctly mentioning, uh, capacity, the value of capacity is the value of meeting demand. So normally it equates the value of providing energy and avoiding um, uh, load shedding compared to the cost of uh, the investments and the remuneration through some um, capacity remuneration mechanism. Um, now, uh, what one point I want to raise is that um, also was uh, was suggested by the by David the fact that normally when we think about the investments in an electricity market the investments in general the investors invest uh, tries to invest in the optimal time 
uh, by maximizing, trying to maximize its own profits uh, and deciding the optimal moment in which in which we should invest. Uh, when there is a CRM, um, uh, the, the CRM provides a flow of uh, revenues uh, um, guaranteed, so deterministic to the investor, uh, but but somehow freezes the electricity system at the time in which a CRM is introduced because it induces the investment if the, if the CRMs are high enough uh, to, to make the investment at the time in which they are provided, the, the, the funds are provided. But in this way, the investor uh, forgoes the possibility to take advantage of the learning externalities that you mentioned, the a fact that, in, that over time, uh, there can be a reduction in the cost and, and the system itself loses this possibility. So normally when we think about the investments in such a dynamic way, uh, we, we need to take into account when it is optimal to invest or not and what's the impact of introducing some remuneration on this timing of investment. And the, the framework to do so is typically the real option analysis, uh, which what, this is what we want to uh, introduce uh, to evaluate the investments uh, in, a, in hybrid energy. Now, uh, what, what we want to study is the following. What's the value of the investment when we take into account uh, when, that there is a, an option value of the investment induced by the CRM? Uh, and, and what do we miss when we just purely compare the, uh, the, ex, the net present value of uh, uh, the benefit and the net present value of the cost of the investments without taking into account such an option value? Um, also, what we want to focus on is uh, when there is this freezing uh, uh, of the system induced by the CRM, uh, is there any difference in the evaluation of the value of the capacity when we consider different types of uh, um, investments, different types of technologies that an investor can invest on uh, when it is remunerated by a CRM? Um, this is the, the, the kind of analysis we want to we want to focus on. Um, in order to do so, uh, uh, we will make a, a very simple setting. So we do not uh, discuss the typical uh, arguments which are whether CRMs are needed or not, or whether they are effective in delivering a series of supply or not. So we do not focus on how, how, how many units of capacity, how much capacity is needed or is delivered. Let's suppose that um, the, 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 there is a the, the CRM is effective in delivering enough security of supply. Uh, what's the impact of this uh, um, CRM on the, uh, on the electricity market? The impact is the fact that when there is enough capacity um, in, induced by the CRM, uh, the system will not, will not see um, uh, rolling blackouts, not anymore or at the optimal level, the, the vol. Um, and this means that um, there is a shift on the remuneration, we all know it, uh, from ex post remuneration uncertainty due to the remuneration of electricity market whenever uh, the price is going to go to the wall because of the lack of security supply, this is shifted ex ante to the, because of the CRM. So de facto, uh, a CRM of any kind has the fact, has the impact of uh, in electricity market of capping the electricity price by introducing a kind of a, a price cap due to the uh, introduction of enough large capacity. Now, by incidentally, this price cap uh, in some CRMs is made explicit. For instance, the reliability option that David was mentioning, uh, effectively, they have the strike price. This strike price is that the de facto price cap, but also other systems have that effect because simply shift the supply to the right, and therefore the price cap is the marginal cost of the marginal technology, which would have been uh, before marginal um, uh, if there was not enough uh, capacity induced by CRM and becomes marginal due to the CRM, okay? Uh, incidentally, also notice that this price cap, also in the reliability option, David was mentioning that uh, it's fixed. In some system it's fixed. For instance, in Italian system, system is random, but, but David is right in saying that logically it should be random because it should be the marginal cost of the marginal uh, technology at the time when that marginal uh, technology is needed to deliver security supply. So it should be random because it should depend on what, uh, the expectation of the marginal cost at, the, at that time. Okay, so the work, uh, very quickly because we don't have much time, um, if you think about in, in, uh, the introduction of CRM in such a framework, 
<clears throat> from the point of the investor who has to invest uh, and gain uh, of the uh, taking advantage of the CRM, but losing something, what does he lose? So what's the type of uncertainty that an investor faces in an electricity market? We believe that it has three types of uncertainties, which are related, of course. One is about these price cap effects. Uh, the other type of uncertainty is about its own cost, obviously, because it has to uh, think about what is going to be uh, uh, the future expected profits, which depends also on the, its own cost. But there is also the risk, a risk in electricity, the fact that it does not know what is going to happen in the future in the market and whether it is itself, the investor, who will eventually become the marginal technology. And when it becomes the marginal technology, it will be the technology that makes the price and therefore we, we lose us the super marginal profits uh, uh, due to this difference between the system marginal um, cost and its own cost. Okay, so these three uncertainties are, are, we believe are different depending on the different type of technologies that one invests on at the time in which it invests due to a CRM. Very quickly, we frame different possible type of technologies which have different uh, possibilities of facing these three risks. Um, one is, uh, uh, think about a, a very simple technology that has no marginal cost and therefore will never become uh, uh, the marginal plant. Uh, think about, for instance, a uh, type battery or st some storage coupled with generation uh, with renewable generation of lines. So there is no marginal cost in generation and no uh, risk of becoming marginal. Then there is also a second technology uh, which you can suppose it's, uh, uh, it's, it's bound to be always more efficient than the technology that it is the uh, marginal uh, plant and is forecast to be the marginal plant in the future. So it will not have the risk of being the marginal um, power plant, but it will have the risk of uh, having its own cost, which can be random. Uh, there can be a, a large base load, which has no probably no risk of uh, seeing uh, volatility in its own cost. Think for instance, a nuclear power plant or uh, some large base load uh, in which the marginal cost, its own marginal cost is sufficiently stable or very limited and not volatile, but it can eventually become the marginal technology depending on the evolution of the system. And then the fourth case, for instance, that's the most interesting one. You think about uh, some form of demand side participation, for instance, uh, interruptibility contract in which the marginal cost is the opportunity cost of losing the possibility to take advantage of the electricity and using that to, to, to produce and sell uh, a good in its own in your own market. So you can suppose that, that, that your own marginal cost is somehow uncorrelated because it depends on the marginal value of the product you are selling in the market is somehow uncorrelated or slightly correlated with the marginal cost of the production of electricity and the possibility of becoming marginal plant, okay? Very quickly, I want to just show you one of the cases uh, for the discussion, the simplest one, uh, which is the battery in which there is no uh, own uh, cost, uncertainty on your own cost and no uncertainty of becoming a, a marginal plant. It's immediately to see that um, the, 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 the flow of profits is made of two parts. One is the, uh, the remuneration of the capacity. This is the, um, permanent flow of uh, um, remuneration of capacity in terms of megawatt hour, for instance, uh, which is deterministic because you know it at the time of investment how much you're gonna be paid by the CRM. And then there is the, op the, op the option value because basically when you introduce a, a capacity, what you do is that you sell to the system operator a, a bundle of a, a call option on your own electricity um, by we, in which which sometimes are marketized by reliability option, for instance, so explicitly as options. But even implicitly, what you are selling is that the post, you are selling to the, the system operator the right to call you whenever you uh, whenever you need it, and because of that, this you lose the fact that the price will not go anymore to the uh, roll, but will stay at the marginal cost of marginal technology at the strike price. So the, that this problem, even this problem can be sold and immediately you see that the value of the investment is made even in such a set, simple setting, the setting in which there is just the riskness due to the uh, uncertainty about what is gonna be the price cap in the market. 
not, not due to your own cost and not even to the fact whether you will lose the super marginal profit. Even in such a simple setting, we immediately see that the value of investment is made of uh, two parts, basically. This blue one is the standard net present value of uh, uh, the uh, remuneration you gain in the electricity market, which obviously is composed by the net present value of the capacity remuneration, this K, and the net present value of the price you will see in the market, which is made basically by two components because there is this de facto price cap, which will impede the price to go above the, the, the strike price whenever it, it would have gone above, above if the system was short of capacity. But this net present value is not enough because there is a further component, which is the option value uh, of the investments, which is this red part. And what is interesting is to try and calculate the, this option value, whether it is positive or negative, and how this is related with the learning externalities that David was mentioning, with the possible evolution of the cost and the price over time. What we see basically is that when there is no evolution of, so comparing with a very simple situation in which there is no, suppose that for instance, the price and the cost follow a dramatic Brownian motion, just for the sake of simplicity, to derive some simple answers, uh, when there is no drift in, so no technological evolution forecasted, it's immediately to see, it is obvious that these uh, uh, option values are, are negative, which means that cheddar is paribus, uh, uh, you, you need the investments in the capacity would be done only if the, the cost, the overnight cost are small enough. Uh, basically, when the overall flow of profit, including the present value, is larger than the overnight cost, which also incidentally explains why, uh, at the time of the introduction of the CRM, the CRM distorts somehow the investment toward those which have the shortest overnight cost uh, uh, at the time of the investment. So, therefore, there are some reports, for instance, which claim that uh, portfolio uh, renewable portfolios would be more beneficial, but they are not invested. Uh, when there is an uh, in when there is a CRM, because obviously they are more beneficial over time, but the, uh, the, the overnight cost is higher than the, the, the efficiency CGT, for instance. But what is interesting, and I will stop here because I'm taking too much time, is that this um, option value uh, need not to be necessarily negative, depending on how, how you forecast the evolution of the cost on the one hand and the price on the one on the other hand. Actually, there is a widening gap. Uh, depending on the, diff the relative ratio of the evolution of the marginal cost on the one hand and the price on the other hand. And there is a larger set of uh, uh, values for which actually the opposite occur and the option value become positive, depending on how you forecast the evolution of uh, uh, the price and the cost. Just one last word, and I will stop here because, of course, the model is much longer, but uh, just one uh, quick word about what would happen, for instance, when there is a, an efficient CCGT in which the investor is investing on, not the battery, uh, in which you see just the difference is this, uh, uh, um, this parameter, which says that your own costs are always correlated with the cost of the marginal uh, uh, plant, and you're always uh, cheaper than that. But even that introduces a, a, a parameter, a further uncertain parameter, such as that the option value of the investment becomes much more compl complicated. Because in this case, you have actually four possible option values that you need to take into account, depending on what is go what can happen in the future, whether the price would have gone higher, but doesn't because of the investment or not, and whether you might have a cost in which, which is too high relative to the price or not. So you have four possible cases that can uh, um, mix together, and, and obviously the, value, the valuation of investment will become much more complex. For the other type of investments, it is even worse because you have furthermore and more option values that you need to take into account. Um, I would stop here. Sorry for having taken a bit more time than needed. Thank you very much, Fulvio. Uh, very interesting uh, again. Um, uh, something, something that we would need to, to think and discuss uh, indeed uh, for, for slightly, slightly longer time. One of the issues certainly is, is uncertainty and risk aversion, uh, how, how they will uh, impact and uh, efficient outcomes. Uh, 
but uh, definitely something to to think about in the in the future your your framework is very very convincing uh, we'll uh, move on in the interest of time which is uh, which is scarce at the same time i would i would like to say we started uh, somewhat later uh, the organizer signaled to us we could have uh, some of the time we lost at the beginning we could have it back at the end uh, i would say let us aim all together to conclude uh, the the session uh, sometime uh, uh, towards towards one o'clock, uh, so so in about uh, fifty minutes, uh, with with two more speakers and and then a, a broad uh, broad discussion, uh, just so that everybody can sort of sort of adjust at the margin his his employee temps, his uh, his um, his activity table, and uh, with that uh, I will uh, hand it over to to Michael who uh, will, will also talk to us on, on that issue. What does it mean to have an efficient market in a, a framework of deep decarbonation? Michael, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, great. So my presentation is really much simpler than uh, the two we've had for which um, many thanks, very interesting. I'm going to mainly just try and put a, a somewhat different idea on the table about how to approach some of the challenges that the previous two speakers have, have identified. Um, and um, oh, that's interesting, is this? Okay, okay, sorry, it was a little slow to respond. Um, so I will start just briefly by reiterating the what I think is the essential point being made, I uh, suspect, by everyone in this session, uh, which is a, a difficult tension almost between operational efficiency and investment efficiency and how best to reconcile those. So it's quite clear that for operational efficiency, spot markets uh, are pretty much the best idea that, that anyone's had. Uh, for organizing electricity systems because they signal marginal cost, efficient use of dispatchable, and, and in the kind of system we are looking at also importantly reward storage, demand side response. And I'm going to use the spot market in a general sense, potentially including things like frequency markets. Um, would, would be an interesting question to discuss how reliability options would, would fit in the kind of uh, approach that uh, I'm, I'm suggesting, consider. Um, but for low carbon investment, highly capital intensive, uh, very, very low marginal cost, capital efficiency is crucial, long term contracts have clearly lowered the cost of capital. I think that is an unambiguous result and not surprising when one looks at it from the investor standpoint. Um, for small amounts, that doesn't matter too much, but they don't reward efficient choice or location. Um, and I think that there are clearly some, some drawbacks obviously can be addressed through capacity markets, as indicated. Other drawbacks for the renewables themselves can be ameliorated by smart design, um, but I think not, not entirely. Uh, or, or are there constraints and limits on the different approaches uh, considered? Now, I thought I would uh, also just to flag, although I think for this session, maybe it, it is taken at least partially for, for, for granted, um, just a basic point about long-term contracts, because I have been struck on uh, some occasions when I've talked about this, about the extent of resistance to the whole idea of long-term contracts. So I have blatantly stolen a uh, text from an email from Jan Horst, for which many thanks, who I think simply underlines also with reference to key uh, literature that, you know, the fundamental problem is not long term contracts, it is whether they are transparent and tradable, uh, which would imply a, a degree of standardization. Um, and so there's, there's a couple of, of the more specific points about under what conditions are long-term contracts a perfectly decent proposition that doesn't pose intrinsic barriers to, to new entrants uh, and market efficiency. And, and the keys are, are, are as indicated there. 
So I don't think we're in a world of sort of fundamental, uh, you know, opposition to the idea, but we are in a world where the way that we have so far designed long-term contracts um, meet some of those goals, but at the expense of some of the points that uh, have already been raised. Now, I also want to suggest an additional reason for pursuing this line of inquiry is, is simply build up on what's happening. Long-term contracts are dominating the growth of renewables. Uh, auctions are demonstrating the efficiency, uh, a good way of injecting competitive pressures. And it's not just Europe. I've recently reviewed a paper that covered South Africa, Brazil, uh, and many others are moving in this direction. There are predominantly auctions, but the states at a fixed price, irrespective of location and without some of the other features um, that, that David has pointed to. Uh, and I will show a little bit of, of, of data about the competitiveness of these. Um, in principle, it's a great solution for initial growth, but which could face growing problems. Let me just give uh, an additional take upon the kind of problems uh, that will emerge. So what I've done here is just shown a projected load, uh, well, the load duration curve as projected for UK electricity. Uh, I'm assuming that with this audience and certainly this panel, you'll, you'll know the, the basics of a load duration curve. But this one is a modeled projection in the blue line of the net load duration curve after the input of wind and solar electricity uh, on the UK system. And that is just given current projections and clear commitments on uh, wind, onshore, offshore, uh, and expected uh, PV, um, which, which indeed may be more than indicated. So what you see is that already by 2030, for roughly 10% of the time on the right hand side, we have more electricity at zero marginal cost than the total demand on the system. And that is before we have considered, the, so that, that's the area here if you can see my cursor. Pump storage will help a bit, it has constraints, this is one indication. But that is also before one's considered the role of nuclear power on the system. And in theory, by 2030, we'll have a, a brand new major uh, over three gigawatts nuclear power station on top of some of the others and other constraints on minimum load. So you can see we're already in an area of substantial periods with potentially excess demand. And at the opposite end, of course, there are periods much more rare than without wind and solar, but still periods where the system needs over 40 gigawatts of something else uh, because it's a, it's a winter peak of, with a, a very cold but very calm uh, stretch. And that has before I've also talked about the dynamics of fluctuation of the wind and PV on, on frequency, stability, etc. So the gap there is showing the contribution of variable renewables. They are a sizable slice of our needs. I've shown the peaking and the peak shaving potential and needs. Mid merit is not a major focus of discussion, except very much assuming that one still has a spot market driven by all these kinds of storage and uh, uh, all these kinds of options. And then we have the surplus, surplus utilization uh, challenge. Uh, and the, the, the challenges and complexities that go along with that as influenced not just by operational decisions, but the siting and mix decisions. Onshore wind, onshore solar, North Sea, West Coast, uh, uh, and, so, and, and indeed other aspects of how turbines are sized uh, relative to wind speeds. So uh, just to provide a, one more empirical bit of background for where, where this is taking me, uh, it is, I think, really maybe still underappreciated the extent of the cost revolution in renewables. Uh, I mean, I, I, I have some engineering background. I was somewhat optimistic about us getting better on, on wind and offshore wind, but I'd certainly never expected, very few people expected a world in which even offshore wind is coming in at prices, 
here I've shown the, the evolution in the three major auction rounds uh, in the UK, but coming in at prices which are broadly the same as wholesale electricity and cheaper than uh, anyone is, is can buy electricity. Um, and that is, however, with, with a carbon price. Um, similar, incidentally, for, for European wind contracts, typically now around 60 to 70 pounds, uh, euros per megawatt hour. In the UK, those round three contracts are around 40. Um, so what I want to inject into this conversation is the very silent partner, which is what about the consumers? What about the buyers? And in particular, what about potential corporate buyers, some of whom might also be very interested in a, at least a degree of long-term price stability? Um, now, I think it's useful to distinguish, we have seen a rapid expansion of corporate buyers of green electricity. Uh, it's evolving through different segments of those markets. Um, but I think probably given the sheer scale of potential growth in renewables, it's a somewhat fractured and in insufficient market to imagine that those would be the dominant suppliers of renewables, um, particularly in relation to the sort of wholesale markets. And the question I want to raise is what about some of the other big consumers? So on the right, I've shown an indication of industrial electricity prices. Um, it's complicated because most countries have some element of carbon price compensation at the moment, which is of course quite messy. Um, but despite that, increasingly competitive prospects. So broadly the proposition is, could we, should we think about two electricity markets? Uh, in a way, we already have them, it's just that we don't think of it that way. We have them because we have auctioned markets, if one wanted to use that term. But the suggestion is we say, fine, the spot market does its job, um, can, certainly including frequency markets. It shows all the things the spot market is good to, to show and illustrate. But also we explore possibility for a market in long-term contracts, uh, specifically with renewable energy. We could debate nuclear, but for the sake of argument, I'll assume renewables. And there, I think there's a case for a pool design, a centralized pool purchasing uh, structure or aggregation rather of your purchasing. But the essential point is it would meet the requirements I set out early on about standardized structures, but without necessarily involving purely public auctions. There would be in effect a contract aggregator that would aggregate on the one side the renewable energy purchases to the green power pool and aggregate on the other the contracts with uh, electricity consumers, large consumers interested in long-term price stability. Now what that does is it, it overcomes, uh, obviously there are potential downsides, but it overcomes the coordination challenge of most purely market-based solutions. There is an aggregator, an aggregator would be judging what is the value of more wind in on Dogger Bank versus maybe off the West Coast in terms of what the pool would require to purchase its balancing services. Now the pool would also of course be looking at what could corporate buyers offer in terms of balancing services. Um, lots of demand side uh, are already rolled into uh, such demand side contracts for some of the companies that I already mentioned in the RE100 or many more than 100 now. And the fact that there would be an aggregator would naturally help to bring in some contract standardization and transparency is required. Um, so if I kind of for a moment take an assumption, mm, interesting idea, could it happen and if so how? I think there's a big question around, would this be another revolution in electricity market design? Uh, and I know I spoke to uh, a couple of companies that were doing a lot of corporate contracts on the demand side, and they said the last thing they wanted was the government to charge in and insist on public contracts of 500 pages or more. But it could evolve naturally in principle, legally there's no barrier to, to contracts or contract bundling. 
uh, in practice, the companies I spoke to said, yeah, actually, they've never been able to bundle corporate contracts because they're all different and they're all tailor made. Um, would it require the states, therefore, to impose a mandatory green pool? Not sure. I've indicated some of the uh, some of the potential drawbacks. I think it might be possible to evolve in the UK, for example, the institutional body that handles renewable energy contracts could be a natural point uh, to facilitate such evolution. But I, I, I offer that as a question about exactly how would one get there. And then finally, um, since this has been mostly a conceptual uh, talk, I uh, just thought I'd offer you one other conceptual diagram uh, which I've shown occasionally before, which is I strongly suspect that we are and should be moving into a world where we no longer talk about the electricity market. We talk about the electricity markets for the different kinds of both services we need from electricity and also the radically different ways of providing electricity. So that I think the future for electricity is not one homogenized product. It's several markets, but those markets are themselves competing with each other as the most appropriate place for given types of supply and demand, as suggested in this chart. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, your last slide, of course, uh, recalls the the very essence of, of hybrid markets uh, that we try to sort of bring together different aspects of uh, electricity services and, and, and value them in, in different, uh, different dimensions. As you, as you recall, uh, the, the idea of, uh, of, of a pool for, for long-term contracts has been a long-standing interest of mine. Just, just one, one word, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think a pool needs to be mandatory, you know, even even uh, in the in the uh, electricity markets today, we have over the counter. We have the the, the organized markets, uh, uh, perhaps just sort of having there a market maker, uh, uh, perhaps uh, from from the public side putting in a sweetener, either either in in fiscal terms or in throwing in balancing services or something like that. Could I think really sort of sort of uh, uh, help developing such a such mm -hmm. a market? For, 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 for long-term contracts. But again, that would of course require a uh, broader discussion and perhaps we have some time after the last presentation, uh, which is a presentation by Fabien Rock. Fabien, uh, you have been working on, on hybrid markets, in hybrid markets for a, for a long time. Uh, to some extent, you and, and, uh, and uh, Dominique Finot and others have have coined uh, have coined the phrase. Um, please tell us what uh, has is your your current sort of view on the on the shape and function of uh, such hybrid markets. Fabien, to you. Well, thank you, Jan, and uh, very happy to be uh, discussing uh, with you and and colleagues and friends on this issue again. I'm um, trying to project my screen. I hope it's going to work. Can you see my slides? We can. Very good. So I'll try to be brief, and I probably won't show all of the slides. Um, so I'm working on a paper that's essentially trying to analyze the diversity of hybrid markets, brackets. Um, the way I define hybrid markets is fundamentally markets in which the price signal itself is not the only driver of investment and exit decisions, meaning that there are other instruments, uh, either you know, contracts, we've discussed long-term contracts, but also often planning mechanisms driving that coordination issue uh, that we have discussed. Now, that's a very general definition, and there are quite a lot of, um, I would say, colors uh, or shades of gray when you look at hybrid markets. What I'm trying to do in this paper is, well, first start with an analysis of the issues 
which are driving the need for such evolution. Uh, what I mean by that is historically the standard market design uh, relied on price signals alone for both the short-term efficiency, the dispatch, and the long-term dynamic efficiency, meaning entry and exit. So what's driving that need for overlaying uh, these mechanisms? Then the second issue is what are the key design features of an efficient hybrid market design? So how do you make sure that that overlaying works in a synergetic way rather than introducing distortions in the spot market? Uh, then I'm trying to do a mapping, a review of the different approaches and identifying essentially uh, a few families of hybrid market approaches. And once I have identified these families uh, or, or archetypes, if you prefer, uh, I try to um, identify the pros and cons. So that's essentially what I do in this paper. And I'm going to start by uh, looking at the, the issues. Why have we um, in Europe, but it's also true more globally, uh, since the emergence of these hybrid markets? Well, I think uh, what's very important is to also have a reality check as to what has driven investment in Europe in generation. This is uh, a little exercise I did trying to look at the total capacity additions based on the regulatory framework when the decision to invest was taken. In black, you see the regulated monopolies. Um, and then you see essentially uh, when you've got stripes, it's essentially merchants either clean or essentially gas plants. There has been some merchant investment a little bit in the 90s, a little bit more in the 2000s, but by and large, it's been uh, the minority of the investments. You see that both for thermal and renewables, long-term contracts, either you know, capacity mechanisms or um, long-term contracts for renewables have by and large driven most of the investments. So I think what we are talking about is, is actually quite concretely happening today. It's not just a theoretical view, if you want. I'll skip a few slides, which are just building to that story, and then talk about the framework we have in Europe. We have focused the past 20 years on what I have here as, you know, the, the roof of the house, if you want, as the short-term markets. Um, we integrated in Europe of their head markets with market couplings. That's been a huge success. We should not downplay that. We are in the process of integrating balancing and intraday markets, that's also uh, pretty impressive. But I think we are lacking um, the fundamental pillars, if you want, the foundations of the house. And, and I think these are the fundamental things that you find in hybrid markets. Some form of coordination in planning on the left and some form of commitment. Um, and that commitment can come through long-term contracts, essentially. Um, so if I try to flesh that out a little bit more, on the planning side, we have new issues emerging. Um, we have essentially um, sector coupling, which is now a buzzword, but the idea is that there's going to be electrification of end uses. Uh, there are going to be obviously big coordination issues through the value chain, probably even more than when we could look at the electricity sector as, as just generation, transmission, distribution, and supply. Now we've got to coordinate across a much bigger value chain, both downstream and, and also horizontally across energy vectors. So the, the coordination issues are really magnified. Um, and then um, essentially we have the challenge to decarbonize at a very fast pace, which means we need to change the capital stock in that industry very quickly. Um, so again, the, the commitment um, from governments and regulators is essential here to have a sound investment frameworks. Um, and, and this is naturally what is underlying this need for, uh, for control. So this is the first part, understanding the drivers. I'm sure you didn't learn anything new here, but it's worth you know, recapitulating it. Now, what are the key features of an efficient hybrid framework? Well, I think the essential part here is we need to decouple 
the short-term market efficiency, which relies on marginal prices, from the long-term dynamic efficiency, uh, which is essentially about entry and exit in the market, uh, and recognize that as long as policymakers will be willing to intervene, to set the mix, uh, or to you know, ensure that some plants are retired at a faster pace than they would otherwise do um, based on purely economic signals. As long as we have that, and we are likely to have that for the foreseeable future, we will need to decouple um, these coordination mechanisms. They cannot be based purely on short-term prices. We have a bigger issue as well, which is for a long time we decoupled infrastructures, so networks, from generation. And that's no longer possible. Why is that? Well, because of you know, sector coupling, as we mentioned, you know, hydrogen infrastructures, um, downstream you know, transport and buildings electrification. Um, and clearly, we have here to find a way to identify what I call a low regret pathway, meaning some of these infrastructures, they are huge economies of scale doesn't make sense to just have a discovery process, build them small, and then find out that we would have been better off building them large uh, later on. So, so we need a minimum degree of, of coordination and commitment uh, when they are large economies of scale. I say minimum because I think that's an important concept and I'll come back to it um, later on. Then I want to build on Michael's point. I think we should stop talking about indeed electricity market and a single commodity. In fact, what we need is to differentiate the different attributes of the product we have. For instance, that's just an example, we need clean energy, we need flexible energy, we need adequacy, and these are different product attributes. Um, and indeed, they have a, a different value in, in an adequate system. So we will need to define a market framework that rewards this. That means that what we are discussing, so identifying the need, coordination, and then providing commitment um, to long-term contracts, will need to apply to these different um, types of, of value for the system. So there are essentially three steps as a conclusion in a hybrid market framework, which are, in the paper I, I propose, you know, worth considering. The first step is a planning and definition of the system needs. The second stage is a contracting and hedging mechanism stage where you have the commitment, essentially. And then the third stage, uh, but it's obviously all interdependent, is to ensure an efficient interaction with the short-term market. So to me, these are the three, if you want, um, this is a framework that I use in the paper to, uh, to consider different market frameworks, different hybrid frameworks. I'm going to quickly uh, look at uh, the typology of different markets, and I'll skip, uh, again, a slide to give you the, the big picture. So I look at the first stage. The first stage, remember, is how do I define the system needs, you know, the planning stage. Uh, we all know the pitfalls of centralized planning on the left-hand side. If you try to have one authority planning what is optimum for the system, well, very often that authority will err on the side of caution and over procure. You'll tell me it depends on the incentives and liabilities of that authority. That's an important problem, you know. Uh, I won't dwell into that, but obviously, as uh, a question of TSOs versus ISOs versus you know regulatory agencies and their incentives regarding planning is uh, very important. On the other extreme, you have the decentralized investment model where nothing will guarantee uh, that you'll meet your targets. Um, you'll probably need to provide some um, stronger incentives or obligations, as I think uh, David and, and Michael were, were mentioned. In between, you have the hybrids. And the question, the fundamental question is, do you want to plan for the total system need or do you want to plan for a residual need? or a minimum need. And I think that's quite interesting as a concept because a lot of the pitfalls with centralized planning are associated with the fact that you task the central planner to identify the optimum for the system. So obviously you'll get too much. Uh, but if you task the system planner to identify what is a low regret or a minimum, 
even if the system planner procures a little bit too much, then you are still going to be below the optimum and the interface with market mechanisms could be quite different. So that's one of the concepts that I developed. Then you have the second stage. So once you have identified how much you want and, and how much you need, you need to procure it. So this is a commitment issue and, and essentially the contracting. You can have either centralized auctions, decentralized auctions. Um, you can organize a market for it. I think Michael spoke to that at the moment. There are different approaches. I think there is another dimension that I want to flag, which is the timing of that contracting. Uh, if you look at my options 2A and 2B, you can have an early model or a late model. What I mean by that is that in an early model, you'd have an exante contracting uh, for some capacity. It can be clean energy, it can be firm energy, whatever. And you have to decide how much is going to be contracted for at an early stage, knowing that you probably don't want to procure everything because you want to let the market potentially add to that. Uh, so the question is, how much is that minimum that I want to procure at an early stage, the low regret intervention? Then you have the backstop mechanism. The backstop mechanism is to say, I'll let the market play, but I will tell the market in advance, for instance, in five years, I'll run a check, and if I don't have enough clean energy, this will automatically trigger an option for the difference, the backstop. Now, there are a lot of complexities around these two models, but I wanted to flag that it's not just a question of centralized versus decentralized, it's also a question of timing and what you procure uh, in these markets. So this is my typology of the hybrid markets, if you want. And then, well, I will need to cut it short, I know, but, but I try in the paper to highlight the way you can assess pros and cons of these different families of hybrid markets. Essentially, there are big trade-offs here. How much certainty do you want on meeting your policy objectives? How much risk are you ready to take to over-procure as an insurance? Um, how much freedom do you want to give to market participants? How much do you want to leave innovation to play a role here in terms of contracting rather than having standardization, um, et cetera? I won't go into uh, all of the details, but I have started you know, some thinking on these different families, which I showed you. And I have a framework on the left, the ability to address policy objectives, the efficiency of the investment signals, in a cross-sector perspective, the allocation of risk, the impact on the cost of capital, which is closely related to the allocation of risk. And also one point that I think uh, both uh, David and Michael raised, which is, uh, do we want to build on what we have in Europe or do we want to start from scratch? Uh, I think these different models are more or less disruptive. Some of these can be evolutions of what we have, others would be a bit more radical. So I think I'll uh, conclude by just wrapping up a few messages. Um, it's quite clear that there is a gap between the, the perception and the reality. Actually, we already have hybrid markets. We just have a range of hybrid markets and we have not, I would say, streamlined or analyzed the properties of these hybrid markets. Um, I have tried to start you know, putting a framework for analyzing this and categorizing them. There's a lot more work to be done and, and a number of papers by different authors at the moment. It's a burgeoning field of, of research. Um, and I think there are a number of concepts which are worth exploring. As I said, planning doesn't have to be planning for the optimum. It can be planning for a minimum meaning a low regret pathway, and that is quite different in terms of dynamic. Um, Long-term contracting, again, um, I think I'd like to come back to the issue raised by Michael. To what extent do we want to have a standardization of these contracts? I'd actually think on my side that probably we want to preserve an ability to have a self-selection process and a menu of contracts rather than just having the central authority uh, determining what's best here, but I appreciate there are also arguments for uh, some degree of um, harmonization so that then can be a secondary market. Um, 
And finally, one question we haven't discussed, but that I'm being often asked is, how is that compatible with retail competition? And I'd say there is a pretty simple answer, actually. Well, it raises legal issues, but, but it's a simple economic question, which is a concept of contractual obligations following load. So if a supplier, if I'm changing supplier, uh, essentially the obligations go with me to the next supplier, so the cascade. Um, as I said, it's not easy from a legal point of view, but it's in place already uh, in some of the Latin American markets. So this shouldn't be uh, a barrier to having these long-term contracts. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Fabien. Uh, this gives a sort of a, a good concluding sort of sort of vision of uh, of the hybrid market issue. But also, of course, opens also uh, towards towards all the different questions that we that we have to that we have to ask. Uh, I, I do have a number of questions, but uh, as as moderator, <coughs> it, I'm, 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 I will be very uh, how should I say uh, uh, very very modest and and and, and uh, um, sort of sort of try to uh, uh, try to stay in the background as much as possible. And I would therefore like to uh, invite the speakers. To, uh, to ask their questions to their colleagues or to answer uh, the questions that are coming uh, uh, through, the, through the chat. Currently, there are no, uh, no other uh, uh, questions there, but I think we still have one hanging there about the transaction costs uh, to which we can come back later. Um, Fulvio, please go ahead. Yes, I have a question for... Um whoever wants to pick it up, because basically it's a point that has been touched by all of you, um, uh, which is about, uh, let me say, how long are long-term markets? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, of course, the slogan, but uh, it, it has a problem behind. Um, uh, definitely, there, there's a difference in the need of hedging between suppliers, retailers, or whoever needs to hedge uh, the, the, the opportunity cost of uh, acquiring energy versus selling it to end consumers and investors. Um, and, and investors, of course, they, then they have different uh, pers time perspective depending on whether they have already um, installed capacity that needs just to be amortized or is already amortized versus new capacity, right? Um, now, it, actually, all financial long-term markets are rather short in, in ter for investors. Um, they, they are all linked, of course, but at most you can have uh, one year yearly futures. Uh, so you can fix price for one year. And, and these are contracted few years in advance because of the delivery. Uh, while the, uh, the duration of the investment perspective is much longer. So they seems much more suitable to be used to hedge for um, suppliers rather than uh, uh, newcomers uh, in in the markets. Um, how do you deal with this? How can how can it's not just an issue of standardization, but there is also an issue of uh, uh, the impossibility. Do you really see that it's ever possible to have a thirty years long term uh, uh, future, for instance? Uh, and if not, how can you hedge the investments if your investments hedge as a, a, a perspective of 30, 40 years uh, time uh, amortization. Let, let me just uh, say, say one thing and then, then hand it over to the to speakers. I think we're talking about different long terms for different technologies, precisely uh, due to, due to their, their technical char characteristics, construction times, lifetimes, and so forth. But, uh, but with that, uh, I'd like to, who, who would like to, to comment? I, I would get Michael and David, and perhaps also Fabian. Fabien, all, all, all three have something to say on that issue. David, please go ahead. <clears throat> yes, well, I, for nuclear power stations, um, given that they have a life of 60 years, um, the UK has suggested 35 years, uh, and that would be consistent with the kind of effective contracts that a transmission grid gets. Uh, but at the other extreme, a battery, which may wear out in five or six years, and clearly that would be quite inappropriate. I, I, the intermediate range, um, it's a trade-off between you want the ability, as, as uh, Fulvio has pointed out, 
uh, to encourage new technologies to win a space in the market. Um, and you want to reduce the cost of uh, the contract, um, the shorter the contract, the faster you need to get the money back. So um, in Britain, it's 15 years. Uh, in Ireland, they thought that was too long and they suggested 10 years. And it's that kind of trade off. Thank you. Maybe I can uh, add a little bit on, on this. Um, I, I completely agree uh, there is a trade off here. And then the question is um, can we reveal the value uh, from market participants to your point, uh, for example? Um, and, and I come back to the idea of the menu of contract um, because we are seeing experiments from different regulators around the world precisely on that issue of, of duration and, and other parameters, uh, presenting a menu. So not just one approach, you know, it's five years, it's 10, it's 15, but, but given a choice. Um, I, I'm thinking of two, um, two examples, one in Belgium where um, the capacity market, they are uh, equivalent, um, you know, or, uh, I mean, there are trade-offs between uh, the length of the contract that is being offered and, and the investment threshold for which you, you qualify to the capacity contracts. And, and you can self-select. And I'm thinking also of Australia um, in their renewable schemes where uh, equally uh, you'd be able to, show, to choose um, the length of the commitment, obviously for an exchange of a different level of remuneration. So, so these are examples of regulators which have chosen not to choose the duration, but have chosen to uh, to put forward a, a, a menu of contracts uh, so that there can be an explicit value uh, of that of that trade-off. Sure. Yeah, they might get an issue with liquidity, but uh, Michael. Uh... Yeah, I, I mean, it's certainly an interesting idea, the menu of contracts and, and what it could uh, reveal. Um, I think we are still in a world where it's useful to be somewhat technology specific. Um, in general, I, I would think the fact that 15 year contracts have been sufficient for offshore wind, which is pretty big heavy engineering, uh, is I think a, a, an encouraging surprise. Um, it seems to be only nuclear that really involves the scale of risk investment and time scale that one needs to think in which case we may as well talk explicitly about does one want nuclear on the system and if so the different ways of supporting it um i do think that and big problem we have with the hinkley point contract is not just expensive but because its subsidy is bigger than anything else it will throw anything else off the system for the next 35 years uh in order to get its subsidy and that is a, a disaster in terms of uh the flexibility of the system as, as far as I can see, uh, if I've understood that correctly. So the interaction of these contracts does require consideration. But the other factor we haven't mentioned is um, what, what market structure might we say uh, investors could expect after their contract expires. For the first time in a recent meeting, I heard an offshore wind generator saying they were worried about the ambition of the government's target on offshore wind. Bit of a surprise. So they pointed out they have a 15 year contract and they're worried that by the time that expires, that they'll be in a market where actually most of the profits from generating are cannibalized because there's so much wind that the, the, the spot price goes close to zero. And they had been banking on some post contract value from their investment. Um, but definitely, I think that is why it's important to think about the interactions with the spot market or whatever market is engaged in operation, rewarding operational electrons. Uh, I think that's become the shorter the contracts for investment, the more important that other question becomes. Thank you very much. Um, we're definitely moving from a, from a stage where we sort of have fairly large consensus, no matter how we call it, that we need some sort of hybrid market structure, but then how working this out concretely is, uh, is, is becoming a, a big, um, a, a very, very tough challenge, precisely in the interaction between the center, between the regulator, the, 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 the centrally set objectives, 
and, and the market and, and sort of uh, capturing that dialectic or, or keeping it sort of on a, on a path that is, uh, that is uh, sustainable, I think is a very, uh, very critical issue. Uh, are there any other questions? Fulvio, please go ahead a second. Sorry, it's my role to be the... <laughs> um, no, 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 that, that, by all means. <laughs> Don't apologize. I, 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 I would like to be challenging uh, Fabian and also yours, a young view about the, the taxonomy of the hybrid uh, market, uh, in particular in respect of this discussion of, uh, you know, making together or keeping together the point of uh, long-term risk hedging versus uh, operational uh, markets, uh, day ahead, balancing or whatever. Uh, because in, in principle, this issue about hedging risk uh, occurs in every investment, I mean, not just in electricity. It's always a, an issue of uh, hedging. Uh, um, so uh, I, I, I think it should be, it would be wise, I'm not saying wiser, but perhaps wise, uh, to distinguish between whether these uh, long-term markets are purely financial ones, uh, markets to hedge risk somehow, or they have some physical aspects. Where physical, I mean they are uh, connected with the need of the investments to deliver security supply uh, in the grid in some more uh, uh, physical way, whether you know the first investments are already planned, uh, connected or so. Because if, if we enter into discussion about how to hedge investment risk per se, th this would we would lose the specificity of uh, um, the characteristic of the electricity system itself. The, the, the different they need to reconcile decision making that occurs in different point in time in time always throughout at every point uh, forever um, whenever there is a electricity going. So I would leave out the, the, the discussion on pure. Uh, um, long-term financial markets, uh, uh, and as they are used, for instance, in, um, in Australia, you know, the, the options, the, um, the even even the the forward that are traded in Europe. I would focus more on uh, the, the 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 need to uh, discuss how long should be the let me call them the physical uh, long-term markets, uh, as I was saying. Um, I don't know if you would agree on this. Fabian, I think that was mainly mainly towards you. I think that's a very good point. And I would not rule out financial products completely. Um, you know, we, uh, I think it fundamentally depends on the product. Um, one, one of the points I mentioned is that we should move away from just a pure energy community because in fact, we, we have different you know, attributes for the system. So if you contract for clean energy per se, uh, and I think Michael also mentioned that you may want to differentiate, uh, then, then you can have you know, a physical uh, market for long-term contracts, for instance, for, for this kind of technologies. Um, and that's distinct from the short-term exchange of energy. Uh, that is also physical, then the question becomes, how do you articulate the two so that you have no distortions um, because they are, they are physical. But I wouldn't rule out completely um, you know, uh, financial aging. And, and I think in fact, they would naturally emerge as a complement. Uh, as, as long as you, you, know, you, you define obligations, you define your products, naturally I would expect some kind of, of you know, um, risk uh, enhancing management tools to emerge um, in the format of, of financial uh, trading as well. But, but the obligation itself uh, can be uh, based on physical contracts. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm taken up here with, uh, with overall management issues. We have five minutes until the end of streaming. I guess it's only four minutes now. Um, so we should probably sort of uh, all uh, um, uh, think about sort of final, uh, final statements. Um, I, th I think one of the issues is uh, coming back to the point by, by Fulvio, is that sort of uh, financial markets have sort of a, how should I say, a, a symmetric perception of risk, a little bit too much, a little bit too, uh, too low, and, uh, and you, you optimize over that. Uh, from, a, from a social point of view, it's not, not at all the same thing. You have a little bit too much, so what? You have a little bit too little, 
catastrophe and the minister has to go. So th that's where it then comes in, where the purely financial market, uh, sort of, sort of the, the, the purely financial vision of the of the system, sort of, sort of runs up to to, to some limits. But uh, definitely, we we need to integrate the the market element. Otherwise, uh, we're in a fully fully socialized systems, and we all know the limits of that. Uh, that was my uh, final statement. I, uh, I would uh, very much give everybody to say sort of in, in 30 seconds what, what is uh, still uh, dear to his heart. And other than that, we'll come back to a full-fledged conference on this as suggested by Fulvio sometime next year, physical. And with that, uh, we'll go in the order. David, last statement, please. Yes, so I would stress the need to improve the locational signals for new renewables. And I think um, uh, something we haven't touched on is coordinating the transmission investment that will go increasingly with those new renewables. And I don't think we've solved those problems yet. Thank you very much, David. Fulvio. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, what makes this discussion interesting is that the fact that there are different dimensions. There's the timing dimension, the horizontal dimension, the location on one. Um, the planning versus market dis uh, the, the, the discussion, uh, the technological evolution uh, that we need to take into account. Um, and uh, I, I think it's interesting uh, where there, there's still a lot of uh, point to be um, invest uh, investigated about to, um, on these issues. Most definitely. Thank you. Michael. Yeah. I, I... David's raised an, another important dimension, obviously transmission uh, is implied quite a lot in where renewables are located. So far, the solution has been broadly, they've carried at least the long term, the, the large connection costs for offshore the, the investors have. Again, it's inadequate. I think in some of these areas, it's impossible to avoid an element of coordination and planning functions, not least because expectations about the future would affect people's um, beliefs about appropriate costs, right? And appropriate long run marginal costs. So I don't, you know, I think we just have to accept that. There's then a very valid debate about how much plan, how strong a role do you give to the planning relative to uh, much more disaggregated approaches. Just one other remark, um, which is uh, in relation to the financial side, of course, just as we're talking about differentiation in electricity markets, finance is not a uniform market. There are different kinds of financiers that behave in different ways. Um, I've been somewhat involved in a project uh, rebuilding macroeconomics, which had a finance hub, which emphasized there are different sorts of money out there and they do have different characteristics. Um, but it is striking how much of the private financial markets are extraordinarily short term compared with some of the conversations that we're having. And I don't know exactly how those fit together or the implications, but understanding financial market structures will become more important, I suspect, for these uh, conversations. Thank you. Fabia. Yeah, uh, maybe one, one more point on, on infrastructures. Uh, David brought the transmission issue. I think there is a, a related point, which is uh, governance. Um, as, as soon as you start discussing planning in one way or another uh, and contracting, that raises the question of who is doing that or doing it and, and with what mandate, uh, what possibly regulation, what incentives. Uh, if you look at what we have in Europe, uh, we have some network plans done by TSOs uh, we have regulators who are not tasked of doing these kind of things. There's been a, a debate uh, in the UK, and that's led to um, the implementation of unbundling. You know, there's an ISO, I understand, uh, in the works in the UK. So I think there are a lot of other issues regarding governance and, and institutions around the planning issue that are well worth uh, considering. Again. Thank you very much, Fabien. With that, I would like to conclude our session on hybrid markets. I would like to thank all the four speakers for, for very, very insightful uh, um, presentations. And we will come back to the issue sometime next year in a physical live format to discuss them at a little bit more depth. Thank you very much. Have a good day.